Hello. 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 It, no, it didn't start out because I, I, I wouldn't know how to approach a frightening, scary movie as like I got to think of an idea. What happened is I, because I come from Baltimore, and <laughs> well, I don't scare anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was approached about doing a documentary about the Chesapeake Bay because it's forty percent dead and it has all those uh, ecological issues. And so I, I gathered information and went, oh, this is really frightening. And I thought, I don't know, a documentary. I don't know if it's the way to go. But I began to think about it and said, well, look, I do tell stories. Why don't I take all the information and then weave it into the story so it would become more credible and that information that floats out there seems credible and then frightening. And so it began to evolve that way. And did you have one science guy that really, like, hipped you to these creatures? Um, we gathered a lot of stuff and then, you know, Mike who wrote the screenplay you know, came upon the fact that the isopods, this parasite that moved from the Pacific to the Atlantic and has been, you know, uh, changing, uh, you know, and when we started to look into it and went, holy God, it was truly, like, frightening. He said, oh, well, this is a nice element to bring into it. This is the next step into it. If you start playing with this, basically this, uh, uh, what you can call the, what the bay is, it's like a, a stew of disaster, and you bring that into it, you, know, you, you, you can play with it. So you have 85% factual information. It doesn't matter if you want to pay attention or not. It just adds a credibility to the piece. And so that's how it evolved. You know, you're the second high-profile filmmaker I've spoken to this month who's decided to go off the grid and do a found footage film, the first being uh, Rob Burnett with whom we made this movie. Uh, the thing is... He decided to use a red cam and then gunk it up in post. I understand you decided uh, to actually use um, the type of equipment consumer that cameras generated. Um, in retrospect, good idea or not? No, I think it was the best thing to do because it, it, it is a hundred percent. We did the test by taking a, a high-end camera and degrading it. And I, I looked at it; still, to me, it looks like a high-end camera. It's degraded. Um, <laughs> I, to my eye, it didn't look real. And so we took about 100 and some cameras, and then we just kept testing them and projecting them and seeing what they do. And then out of that, we picked like 20-some that seemed, all right, we'll use this. We'll use the Sony for underwater thing for the, you know, with the kids, and they can go under and whatever. We'll use this. We'll use the iPhone. And we just picked and choose so we had this visual palette. And that, to me, became like as real as you can make it because it is real. Was there any particular camera you got out into the field and discovered uh-oh? And how did you work around Well, the uh-ohs came from the fact that, for instance, if you take, like, an iPhone and you're going to give it to someone to, to, to shoot something, you have no video playback, right? You can't see it at the time. So you'd send the girl into the other room and tell her what to do and how to, how to do the thing, and you have to get in another room because you'd be in the shot. And then afterwards, you come back and you look at it and see. Oh, well, that's good. Next time, can you go in there and do this? This, blah, blah, blah. and then a couple times with some of the actors, you go to look at it and there's no playback because they didn't hit the record. <laughs> oh, right. That's why they're actors and not takers, right? And the other thing is, if you went to a red camera, one of those things, it, it, there's a difference between that camera and the consumer camera you hold in your hand. You know, you can't hold the red camera the same way. It, it, it's subtle, you know, and maybe some people, but to me, it's not, it didn't look real enough. When you see somebody grabs a camera from one person to another, exchanging the hand, you cannot do it with a, a bigger camera. So that's what we went with, and, you know, you had to hold your breath initially because everybody was nervous about that idea because you have to be very careful. You got to take that camera, you got to download the chip, you got to do all, you know, because you can lose all this information. And so it's just a, technical nonsense as far as the cast you went with unknowns yeah. uh, what did you look for when you were casting I mean they all have professional experience wanting to work for you in the past uh, so what did you look for in the casting sessions especially given that they were unknowns I'm looking for people that I just 
you know, that you can just believe as being as real as they can be. You know, it's like, you know, if you put Matt Damon in a role, and then the whole movie goes out the window, he could be a great actor, but it's cre- it, it tweaks the credibility. So you try to, like, this put together this people, group of people that seem like, oh, we, we found them, you know. It's like when we talk about the movie, because I guess it falls into the found footage genre. But I, I hadn't, it never occurred to me about this found footage genre. I was thinking if, if a town, a catastrophic event happened to a town, and there was no media, how would we know what happened? And because of all this, we'll now get an intimate look into a town and its people that we never would have had in the history of mankind. All this stuff gives an intimacy that never existed before. So Pompeii, it's like, well, in Pompeii, but what, what was happening in two people in, a, in, you know, in the street? What were they talking about? You know, so this, that's what I was thinking about. So it, I mean, it sounds stupid and naive, but I wasn't thinking found footage. I was thinking, how do you document it? Sort of like uh, it would be th- anthropological or archaeological. Is how do you gather to see what the people were talking about? Because they're not all talking. They don't know what's going on. And so that was what I was interested in. The structure kind of reminded me of like citizen journalism, with uh, the girl saying, "This is what I saw. This is what I was able to gather. I don't work for an accredited journalistic agency, but I'm doing this, putting it out there." Um, is this sort of a continuation of how you looked at how journalism tells stories in like Wag the Dog or Hollywood or um, Man of the Year even? Is that something you were thinking about when you were doing this or did I just overread it? <laughs> no, I, 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 was, I wasn't really thinking of it. I was thinking of if you had some, some intern, you know, with a little you know, thing who got most of the stuff incorrect and was caught up emotionally in it because that I, I was fascinated by the fact in the beginning you know because I, I worked in news in the beginning etc and so you have to look at news as a professional and not get caught up in it and she gets caught up in the emotional aspects of it because that's where you are in the beginning and I thought well that would, I'm just looking for the, the, the human behavior of it all so the irony is that she stopped filming she got so scared she couldn't even film anymore. You know, I mean, I, I just liked the idea because she didn't even quite understand what was going on and she couldn't make that step. So I, I was looking at the human dilemmas of it in that regard. Following up on that, um, what I think made the, the film work better than a lot of the found footage films was the sort of overarching narration that she provided. So was that a conscious decision to sort of help tie it all together? Yeah. Yeah, I thought that I needed, I needed some connection uh, some connection and I, I, I'm a bad student of film in terms of if I can apply this to that and if I can do this to that and I so and so did this and blah 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 and I, I don't know how to utilize it but but the one little thing that that hovered in my head was um, of all things and I, I we actually used the music for a moment was our town because really? in our town the narrator not the narrator, the stage manager. He says, that's a young so-and-so. You know, he died in World War One. I. I remember the first time I went, he died in World War One. Now I'm going to watch the whole show, and he died in World War One. <laughs> you know, and, and I, there he is. He's, you know what I mean? So he's in it. So if, if you watch the movie in its own little subtlety, they're playing our time. Right. He says, all right, that's enough of that. You know, people don't want to hear that music, but something more upbeat. But in her narrative, she says, that's the so-and-so couple, blah, blah, blah. They did a lot. Of, uh, they died at 2:20, and then you go, "What?" So that would be maybe my my only reference is that I was using our town in, in that in that way. In the process of making the film, or in the writing of the script, did you know how much you were ratcheting up the horror of it? I mean, it's like it, it almost seems like you step back and, like I said, it has this exorcist-like effect of like. You don't you you don't go in having a premise of what you're going to get, and then suddenly it gets worse and worse and worse. Did you go? Oh, let's add this in and let's make it even worse. Than them. Let's torture them even more. <laughs> well, we did as we went along. You find a few things. You say, is it possible if we can do this? You know, because it's part of the fun of it. If you can, you know, you're shooting fast and loose and whatever. But the, an added thing, for instance, I don't know. Oh, I know what it was. We had some. It was a great. He was terrific. The the guy who was had to make some of the wouldn't call it puppetry, but he was able to do some things. And there's a thing where they're at, she's washing her face. And I said, wouldn't it be interesting if we have a guy, he's lying there, you think he's dead on the other side, and they go around. And he had this 
eyeball or whatever. I said, could it just, like, the eye just move just a little? We'll just do that and scares the shit out of it or whatever. And he said, yeah, let's try that. All right. So we, get, we had a guy there, and then they put this head on him. And the eyeball just moved the slightest amount. And it went, oh, that's good. Let's try that. So there was a couple times we say, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Well, I was waiting for one of those things to jump on the baby. <laughs> I, I'm surprised you didn't exploit the baby further. <laughs> was there a temptation? No. I thought it was enough. Hopefully somebody goes, get the baby out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I noticed, um, because with all the film footage films that start I mean, coming out, uh, you know, they started almost repeating each other. And one thing I think that you did that I love is having the very, instead of one piece, one camera that was found and showing that story, you took it from several different cameras and pieced it together. So it's several different people's story, not just like one group of people going through right. this town. And I think that's what really makes this film stand out as I really enjoyed it. It was a really good film. Is that something that was it written that way or did you decide to No, no, no. It was designed that way. As I was saying, as you are saying, there's all these different stories in this collection of all these cameras. And then some things evolved out. So for instance, the iPhone girl, you know, originally she was supposed to, she says, look, you know, I don't know what this is or whatever. And that was the end of it. But I sent her in the room, as I said, I sent her into the room. I told her, I gave her some backstory. I said, just, you can just talk like you got your friend. Talk. And she talked, and I, I probably kept, you know, 30 seconds of it because it was better than that. And I said, oh, you know, she's so great. And she, because she's got a video camera, she has an iPhone, why don't I send her to the hospital? Because that's where she's going to go anyway. And now I got another camera. So she's, I'm at the hospital. Look what's going on here. So it allowed me to get... So we built up her role as we went along. And the funny thing is I said to her one day, I said, I'd like to use you in another scene. And she went, well, because she shouldn't seem that, she not that interested. She says, no, I'd like to, but I'm, I'm going to need a note from school. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that girl also brought a lot of human yeah. um, emotion into it, because when she's talking to her friend, there's nothing else oh, I can yeah, really say, so but I, I don't want to be here by myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she yeah. Was in the, when she was in the stairwell. Yeah. And yeah. I thought, you know, that was just great because it also brings that more meaningful emotion rather than just people that are running scared. Well, that that's part of the that was part of the thing as I said when I, I when I thought, you know, and found footage is certainly like the, the labeling devices when you went past it is that you would find these strange moments of of just behavior that are completely outside of the box no one had to be there to video her she was there with her camera talking the the intimacy of it she doesn't understand what's really going on and she just desperately wants to hold on to somebody and that was the other thing because everyone you know watching it knows what's going on yeah no one else does and no one really does until kind of the end when the the reporter pieces are all together yeah 